I guess, I mean, one thing that I wanted to start with is um, actually, it's an amazing show that you have here. And one thing that um, is really interesting is that a lot of people, I see a lot of people like looking in from the windows, like from the street. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the colors that you both use, um, which are really vibrant and um, by coincidence sort of complement each other, I think. And so I was wondering if you could talk about the colors that you choose and why you choose them. Um, it's fun. I wanted to ask Rachel actually, because I noticed that fluorescents appear in your work. They do in mine as well, but it's those, they're really tricky colors to work with because they kind of have a life of themselves, like a spectrum that they kind of, they kind of hit the spectrum oh, in your eye in such a way that they can really take over a work, but you manage them so beautifully. I was kind of like, awestruck by that but I love that you integrate them because I don't know many artists that are able to handle them in the same way. Yeah that is a very uh, common thing I think that we have in the work that's in the show. Um, I think the fluorescent color I actually found this really amazing fluorescent orange rope and I've been using it um, because it contrasts so well with the white of the wall and I think it has a very nice like ability to like pop and be this constant color that gets to go throughout the work. And so that's kind of where the fluorescence started. But um, then I just started to use it to mix in my colors. It's actually really nice to mix in your colors. Um, it brings a lot of like great saturation and brightness to the colors. And I think that might be a lot of um, what's in, the, in my paints. I, I'm always kind of using fluorescence. Do you use a lot of fluorescence? Yeah, all the time. It's uh, it's funny. I like. I was kind of a little closety about like mixing them into everything because they have such a like the like they have such a chemical background as opposed to like you know natural so called natural colors that it, they felt kind of industrial for a while, and so I associate them with like nightclubs and things like that. And um, yeah, they can have a very like kind of day glowy kind of like club feeling to them. So I, I do like to use it like limited amounts, but that doesn't always happen, you know. <laughs> I'm seeing like, like black light paintings and stuff like that. And I would always think of like these goth bars that I would go to as a kid where they would have the, the black lights in all the bathrooms so people couldn't find their veins to shoot up. But it would make oh, no. whatever you were wearing, if you like had a little bit of fluorescent, like just like pop. Um, but I got excited by the fact that they they hit the eye in a particular way, the, the fluorescence, because there's there's radioactivity in the pigment, they have a half-life too. Like the color, color always seems to me to be this this other thing. Like it's not just it's not just the the saturating quality in an item that you're looking at. Like it's almost like an it's a kind of like an organism to me. And fluorescence kind of showed that off a little bit and that they seem very much themselves. Like there's, there's nothing else like them. They, they do something to the eye, they do something to the, the person who's perceiving it and like telegraph something really kind of electric and unique. And so I kept mixing it to yeah. like all the pigments just to kind of bring them out like a little more, make them dance a little more on the eye. So. Yeah, hearing you say that, it reminds me of how fluorescent colors, a lot of like fish that live at the bottom of the sea are, yeah. how there's these insane colors that we probably can't even see. Uh, and I think that like fluorescents kind of speak to that kind of like huge spectrum of color and interaction with like uh, as many different things as like opening up the eye, I think. There were all these uh, photographs, I can't remember, um, sort of recently of bird beaks that were taken showing off the different spectrums that birds can see in each other's beaks that we obviously can't. And so you realize like how narrow our scope of vision is compared to, to other animals. And so, and the fairly limited palette that people tend to turn to when making certain types of artworks and also the kind of palettes that we get locked into historically in like different periods, you know, like muted tones or like I think like the kind of chemical industrial revolution of like the 19th century where like suddenly it was just like the color of iron the color of you know gasoline the color of like all these things like they were like muted kind of drab sort of tones and things like that um 
and we just get, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting relationship we have getting like locked into these little narrow ideas of like, oh, this is the, pa- this is the palette for this era. Definitely, yeah, that happens a lot. Or even like the palette for what we feel is kind of normal, I think. And so I guess I'm, I'm always kind of looking at uh, a lot of houses that are painted really beautiful colors and have a lot of decorations on them. And I kind of like that seeing these communities where each house has this different personality. And I think about that a lot when I think about color and using color. It's this idea that we have this muted sense of everything, like white to gray is kind of like this normal idea of what uh, we should live around or what we should have to be comfortable around. And I think that expressing that uh, there is more options to that is always a possibility and kind of speaks to a little bit of like this kind of muted lifestyle that we can have of just gray or white or you know like kind of like a light yellows and things like that like this kind of like hygienic res- like respectable kind of like i like think of like corbusier who was like a germaphobe like mm. stripping everything down to this like very narrow palette and like trying to keep things like you said like muted have you um have you ever been to the manil collection in houston no, I don't think so. I went. I've never been to Houston, so I don't even think I know uh, it, that collection. I did a show down there. It's a really, it's a gorgeous museum. It's uh, it's Lorenzo Piano. But the interesting thing is the way they set the museum up. As you approach the museum, all of the outbuildings are painted this super drab, uh, beigeish gray tone, so that as you approach the museum, your eyes kind of get muted, so that when you hit the museum everything just pops for you. Like they almost create like an environment around the museum. So like when you enter it, you're just like, oh, wow. That sounds amazing. It's, it's, I had never really given it like a lot of, of thought. Like I'd heard a lot about it, um, you know, but when I finally went, I was like, oh my God, it's true. There's something about this museum that's really extraordinary. And they, the fact that they start you like, like almost like a half a mile before you're in the door. To That's awesome. That's like an experience. I guess I think about experience a lot with my work. So thinking about architecture and space is definitely like an interesting draw to come to when talking about art is like even just the experience of a space and how you interact with that color around you is definitely the same as uh, the work that I'm trying to like kind of make as an experience with painting and I think that's a really interesting draw. I'd love to see that that collection in real life. That large piece you have that's on the the wall, um, the long piece with the suspended circles, the kind of the elongated work. I'm sorry, I want to look the name up, but I'm afraid that if I touch my computer, um, <laughs> I'll, I just wanted to actually <laughs> uh, to look down the scene. Um, yeah, for, yeah. for people who have joined us um, in the last few minutes, we have a link to the uh, exhibition on in the chat. So if you click on it you can see Scott and Rachel's works that are in the show and you can scroll to the bottom and see the specific works that they're referring to. So I'll um, let you continue. I just wanted to say that for people because a few people just joined uh, in the last couple of minutes while you were speaking. That's awesome. Thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs> I, um, I was gonna say to you, Rachel, they, uh, that piece in particular, like the way that it takes up the wall, it's kind of, knocked me out because I was used to the works that I'd seen in your show previously at Cooper Cole and that I've seen around variously where they're much more, I mean, they definitely detonate outward some of them, but a lot of these works in like, you know, concise, like within a boundary, like you get, you can kind of take in the full expanse of them. Sorry, there's going to be a siren passing here. But yeah, no, I know what you mean. Like that the work before I was working, I think, to speak a little bit to like what's happening, I think in this time of like having a lot of time to kind of draw and think a lot about my process, I kind of was trying to make work that felt as much of using the material as much as it can. So like using the flowier material to really have as much dramatic uh, drop in flow and to have the ropes that were more stiff do that type of a line and to have um, more of using each material exactly as it is just not only in how it looks but how it is as its physical object and so 
uh, with that piece for sure, you can kind of see that there's a stretching of like, there's a lighter weight canvas mixed with like a heavier weight canvas and also um, the structures that are wood panels. So there's a lot of mixture of different painting materials all to kind of allow there to be a lot of space and movement and breath in the work. And so that was kind of what I was uh, trying to do is kind of be opposite of this uh, constraint that I'm usually making, which is kind of like creating an imaginary box around the works. Right. And in that work, I think I wanted to create the box to be just the whole entire wall or a, more of the space and not so much of a square that usually is around it. So I wasn't imagining that. Like, cause I always felt like your works, I could kind of like take them in as like this, like you're saying that imaginary box, but this mm -hmm. kind of, I always, I, I guess I like to like, I like to watch my mind as I'm looking at a piece just to see what the process is. Cause the brain does this weird thing with abstract works. Like when we see a, a representational piece, the brain assigns, you know, um, areas of priority, like, oh, we zero in on like the space that the, the, the figure's inhabiting and like, you know, the facial expression and everything else. Whereas with an abstract work, brain scans have sort of showed that we try to understand it from like outside rather than like zeroing in. And with that piece, for some reason, like I just, I could feel like just the limits of, you know, my, my peripheral vision trying to like expand to kind of encompass it. It's almost like an embrace with that piece. I mean, maybe because it has like a sort of like hug kind of like, I don't mean that a goofy or like schlocky way, like it, but it has that embracing feeling to it, maybe because it's like landscape proportioned, but there's something about the wall just kind of disappears with it. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I mean, that's definitely what I'm trying to do. And I think that's kind of like, what's interesting in your works too is that there is that plane of like the black that you're using to kind of block out space and I think that was kind of like one of our, our questions or where we started which is like how we're using color and I think that you're creating even more of a space between the white of the wall by using the black right and so we are speaking in the same language but kind of in opposites um I think that's really interesting that we're we're working in the same way with using color to kind of create depth and space. Yeah, you've kind of like broken away from the wall mm -hmm. to create the space. And for me, I guess, I mean, possibly because like my background in, in film or whatever, like I'm still the square as the the delineated area of vision, which we're like even dealing with right now, like with the, the screens that we're looking at, like the idea that that's, only tells part of the story is kind of fascinating to me, but the blacks have always been this idea that they're like a, like a fecund black, like they're like a creating void rather than like the whiteness of the wall, which is a more like deadening or muting kind of thing. Yeah, well, I want the idea that these things kind of like floating in or creating themselves out of infinity rather than like being suspended in a, um, it's not, it's not, the black's not nothing, if that makes sense. No, definitely. I feel like it's the opposite of that. It holds like a lot of space and like uniformity in the work. Yeah. 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 I want to kind of, I almost want to feel like they're like organisms inhabiting an environment. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Scott, you said something. I was wondering if I could ask you a question about it. I mean, you were talking about um, historical specificity of colors. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering how, if, if that is reflected in your work or how you make decisions about color in this moment, or if that's like changed this year um, with the world being very different this year. Um, it's, yeah, it's fun. like, I mean, I started off making a lot of collages that were kind of black and white, but then sort of uh, tempered with, with, um, cut flower paper that was kind of added on top. So there'd be these kind of bursts of color. And I thought that in doing that, people would eventually ask the question like, oh, what's the relationship between the black and white collage and the color pieces? And I thought it would have um, 
I thought it would just extend the, the discussion around psychedelic art or the tradition of psychedelic art. And when I say psychedelic art, what I mean is literally what psychedelic means, which is it manifests the mind. Like you suddenly become aware of the process of your mind while you're looking at something. And if your mind is like crunching together all of this disparate data and making something out of it, I actually think collage is a huge connection as well between Rachel's work and my own um, in a major, major way. Um, but I was interested too in like, who, who is it that brings these colors into their work? How is it that color gets brought, you know, out of like, you know, um, from very drab periods of history into like thinking like 1950s US conservative, who was it in the sixties that kind of like ferried over these colors into the artwork? Who was it that kind of like detonated this idea of like, uh, brightness and a way of seeing, and, you know, there's a history of things like drug taking or there's characters like, you know, William Burroughs, like experimenting and, and sort of injecting a lot of dialogue about color in, the, in his writing. And it's these kind of fringe figures that tend to bring it over. There's actually, there's a great, there's a great anecdote from um, James Baldwin. He was walking through a really drab part of I think, I think they were in Harlem with uh, the painter Beaufort Delaney. And Delaney like points into a puddle and says, look. And Baldwin looks and notices like a kind of gasoline rainbow kind of in all of this drabness. And it's this moment for him where he realizes that it's there constantly. There's this kind of vibrancy that's just like aching to be observed, but that you have to know to look. And so I'm interested, in, I'm interested in the history of people that teach each other how to look. Mm -hmm. So that you, know, I, you can give people all the information that you want um, and you can give people artworks and you can kind of point people in the right direction. But I think teaching people how to actually perceive is, is a kind of vital part of what what artists are supposed to do. I was talking with um, my, my partner, Paul, about uh, the fact that like someone like Steve Mnuchin grew up with a father who ran a gallery that shows like, you know, David Hammonds and Mark Bradford and like, you know, these fascinating, like, I mean, David Hammonds is like one of the most interesting artists like, you know, alive right now and yet he produces like a kind of monstrous offspring like Steve Mnuchin. It's like, how does someone who's around this artwork not glean the humanity from it and become a better person? It's like, oh, well, obviously the artwork by itself is nothing. If you, if you can't give someone the instructions on how to look at it, it doesn't do anything by itself. And so the, again, like the, the history of how people instruct each other in how to look. Um, and usually it's in, usually it's in an intimate way. Usually it's like one-on-one. -on -one. Usually it's a sort of like mentor student kind of way. Um, I have one piece in the show, um, the night, night, kiss, kiss, love, love piece, which actually sits opposite that gorgeous, um, work of Rachel's that I was just talking about. Uh, that piece is about, um, this artist, Genesis Pior, she was essentially like a mentor of mine. Um, I know Genesis like is a controversial figure I understand that but um, in terms of what she taught me uh, in terms of the value of like slowing down and carefully looking and examining uh, things that are uh, accepted without um, criticality has been instrumental I mean probably changed probably saved my life so you know and that was that was a very like intimate kind of learning relationship what do you mean without criti criticality? Can you, sorry, I, just, I just want to understand oh, yeah. that a little more. No, of course it's, you know, the, the forces one is up against, and maybe forces is not the term, but the, the things that one is up against day to day in terms of like accepting the models of how to behave, accepting what is considered acceptable ways of behaving, uh, accepting um, systems that are so far entrenched that we don't recognize them anymore. Mm. 
and I'm even talking, you know, everything from major systemic racism to like minor civilities, you know, there's a lot of automatic systems that our brains run. Our brains are top down kind of things. Like they're designed to conserve energy, you know, like it or not, our brain, you know, we, we inhabit these sort of time suitcases that we kind of travel through life with that wear out at the end of like 70 plus years. And the machine that we're in, that our consciousness is in, is made to do certain things efficiently. And part of that efficiency is running little programs over and over and over again so we don't have to think about every little thing that we do. And those programs are extremely susceptible to reinforcement. And so you're in an environment, you're in a culture, you're in a kind of solute that teaches you certain things by rote. We just do these things over and over and over again. We perceive these things over and over and over again in this one particular way. And it's really, really hard to shift that, that mode of perception. And uh, I mean, we just, saw, we just saw it now with this pandemic. Like we were in a situation where if we were able to conquer our worst, most ridiculous impulses momentarily, we probably would have been close to eradicating it. Now it looks like we're going to have it forever. And we're gonna have it forever because we couldn't conquer those relatively minor behavioral loops that we're trapped in. It's, you know, it's the most deadly serious thing there is. And yet these are tiny little, you know, um, I gotta keep saying loops that we kind of lock into. And yeah, definitely. I think that's like kind of connects to like the idea of like creating work is kind of like a human experience of like reacting to what's everything that's happening around you. And so it kind of influences you without you even noticing. And I think, a lot of the times we grow up together as like a society. So you kind of are waiting for the next person next to you to do something. And so I think a lot of the times um, you can see something or like, for example, like everyone passing by and looking into the show, I think there's a kind of big difference in our work, especially when like the time terms of like construction, but there's a lot of similarities. And so I think that is something that's interesting for to see. When I caught your show um, the first time, like it's so funny because I remember you were like standing there talking um, and I almost like pounced on you because I was like so overcome and excited by your work. <laughs> Cause it like, it did that thing where it kind of like shook me up for a second. I'm like, oh, this is, you know, like being awake and staying awake are two things. And so I was just like, oh yeah, that's right. It like put me back in my body, it put me here and now. And uh, when Simon proposed the, the two person show, I was like, oh, wow, like now I can, you know, seeing the kind of the, the artworks, like the machines side by side, it was great walking into the, the exhibition was installed because Simon did such a uh, beautiful job of installing it. Like kind of the, the, the mechanics of it sort of get like a little more exposed or at least to, you know, to us, like you understand like what we're, what we're looking at and what you know, the process is. Definitely. And it was crazy that I had taken that SIP fellowship in the Robert Blackburn. So I did those prints that are in the downstairs space. Um, and those work really well in conversation with your work too. So it's really amazing. Yeah, naturally, yeah. I yeah. wanted to ask you about the prints because the prints kind of blew my mind. What's your process? Like the pro I love artwork where I look at it and I just can't figure out how it's made. It's uh, just those are actually made backwards. It's like a little bit, hard to explain but everything that you're seeing is actually made opposite and so I do all of the line and fine detail first and then I go back in and erase a lot of things and add different layers of detail so they're technically mono prints that have acrylic uh, cut out like uh, relief and um, oil and it's just like a process of uh, working on each, uh, which is like exactly how I make my work, which is like working in different parts. And so um, the acrylic part is one sheet and the oil is the base. And then there's hand-drawn parts, that's another piece. And so there's a lot of cutting and mixing from all these different things that are already created uh, to then 
make it this one seamless looking piece. Um, so it is a collage, but it's kind of like into the system of making um, kind of seamlessly is kind of collaged in a print printmaking. Are they, are they model cuts? Like, are they on, uh, what's the, the block that they're on? The, the initial surface that you kind of carve into? Oh, uh, uh, plexiglass? Oh, wow. Okay, because yeah. they're, they're so seamless that they're mysterious. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a process that I learned from this, the teacher at Robert Blackburn. Her name is Karen uh, Leader, I think. Uh, I have to double check her name, um, her last name. But uh, it's a process that she created on her own. And so I got to learn it from her. And uh, you should definitely, anybody, I mean, if there's any way to like, see a virtual class of how she does it that's really interesting um but she pretty much creates everything similarly to me of like separating all of the parts and then putting it together so it does look very seamless but it's a lot of collage that happens really fast um at, while i'm working uh at the press speaking of collage so did you do you have a collage but i mean i the paintings are collages and the the prints as you're saying are collages do you have like a straight up collage part of your practice or did you ever have one with like cutting you know pieces out of i don't know magazines or stuff like that oh uh i think i, I was cutting up photos uh, at one point uh and also doing like found sculpture uh, i think that was kind of like my first uh, working with collage and and that was a uh, kind of way before i was even really i kind of went through a few phases through my work so a few times where I was working with a lot of sculpture, but then a lot of times I'm working with a lot of drawing. So I think that's kind of how I've come to this place of like having mixed backgrounds and also trying different things. So um, there's a drawing aspect to my work, but there's also the sculptural aspect. Um, and I think that comes from trying to do a little bit of found art sculpture at one point. I wonder if that's like a bit of overlap that we have too, where we're like we're kind of like looking at different ways of represent like using image like you know drawing or sculpture or collage or printmaking you know rather than sort of settling down into one particular definitely everything just kind yeah. of feeds into itself how are you um working with the the final like black that's in your work are you working with that backwards as well or do you work um in a printmaking like inspired by printmaking it's um I guess the, the way it's, it's a bit, it's a bit backwards. Like I actually start usually with an image that has a lot of like meaning or salience for me. Um, but probably doesn't mean anything to anyone else. Like if I want to, uh, focus on something like, um, like the principle of com compassion, for example, like if I want to focus on that, I, there are different ways I could represent that to myself that would probably be meaningless to someone else. Um, or are such hackneyed kind of images that they would become meaningless. It's like saying the word spirituality, like it instantly kind of like falls flat because it's been kind of run through the mill so many times. So I start with an image that I have a personal connection to. And then I just kind of let the, I look at it like a field of collage. I kind of, I mean, imagine a little bit like the process of you looking at materials where suddenly you're like, oh, this curve, I'm gonna go over here and focus on this curve for a while. This color, oh, I'm gonna go over here and work on this color. And they might be disparate parts. You know they're gonna unite in a whole, but you're suddenly looking at it kind of atomized, you know, all these different separate pieces. And so I go through and then I begin to isolate parts where something uh, sort of magical has happened with, with the paint and the colors and the gesture. And then I just kind of like isolate these areas and they end up kind of turning into these sort of refracted, like in my head, they feel kind of like organisms. Like they feel like they, they have a separate life. They're intimately connected. Like they all belong to each other. None of them would exist without any of the other pieces. They're all reliant on the existence of everything else. But this little thin layer of, you know, space between them makes it look like they have autonomy by the end of it definitely if that makes sense yeah i think that's happening also with my work in like this use of line and using the material to represent line so i just started 
or I have in the last few like gotten really uh, attached to using these hammocks in my works. And I think it's just this representation of the line that has its own, not only connotations in the real world, but also uh, just that um, diamond shape with all of those lines um, becomes its own um, move and like kind of signature uh, drawing technique. Um, if I'm thinking about it as line. I was gonna ask you about the hammocks because like they don't, I didn't guess that there were hammocks originally or some of the, there were hammocks in some of the originally. Is the hammock meant to telegraph anything else other than the fact that it's like a piece of, of canvas with ropes attached to it? Like is there, is there a sense um, of leisure or I don't know what? I think that's is. definitely part of it as well. I think it kind of goes in well contrast with the rope that I'm already using. And yeah. then I think that, um, like how you said, it's like, it can go really, um, blend really well into the works because there is that one uh, bar at the top that kind of just reads as a line as well. And so then you can forget what you're looking at in a way that I think I want the work to feel that's part of um, the work being successful for me, kind of getting lost in those materials. Yeah, I never look at it and say hammock. Like I'm always like, there's like always more yeah, I picture a hammock being like, usually like I can, tune, if there's a hammock, I'll tune out. I mean, as if, I'm, <laughs> like if I'm in one, like that's what it's for. Like I'm just like, you know, whereas your work seems more, uh, just more electric. Like it seems more like, you know, the- Well, I the, feel like it could look like really cheesy and like kind of fancy, <laughs> but like, I get, I get, you mean like tune out inside of it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But like I, the, there's this the there's a spirit of motion in it too like i feel like i look at your work and it kind of writhes mm. like my eye doesn't settle anywhere like it doesn't feel like there's like a focal point which is kind of what i keep trying to do with my with the paintings as i don't want there to be like one like principal area yeah i think that's definitely something that our works are having in common in the show for sure I think one thing that you're you keep touching on, Scott, which I think is really interesting, is the you know the idea of relation between colors and between um, shapes and bodies, and um, and I was wondering, I mean, in a in a way, like stepping back, like, and this question is for both of you, really, um, about what you were thinking about as you were making these works in this very very specific context of making work for an exhibition occurring now, um, especially in, you know, in your case, Rachel, being in New York, um, which was, you know, hit very hard by COVID. Um, I, I was just wondering, yeah, like, what were you thinking about? Did your conceptual framework adjust a bit in terms of your relationship to your work? Um, or was it something that brought you back to your practice more strongly? I was just, you know, it could, it might not have changed. I'm just curious if it did. I think that it definitely changed. I think maybe um, more of the connection with the work, I guess, because my work, I've always seen it as something that is for me. And I think that with so much going on, I think I kind of zoomed in even more to the work. And so there was just even more time in the studio and I guess even more, time thinking about the process, which is a really big part of the work. And so getting that, that part down, I think has helped the work a lot. And um, I think that time, even though it was so chaotic, it was the work became that like place of sense in a you know, very like kind of typical way. But I think that I didn't, I would expect to have been very disconnected, but I think it was, Kind of the opposite that's really interesting um and one more uh, before scott sorry i would like to hear an, your answer too but i was wondering rachel if you could type in the chat um the name of the printmaker that you mentioned earlier and the technique i think a couple people wanted to look okay, at let me um look that up and I'll okay <laughs> maybe while scott's okay. answering the question <laughs> thank you uh it's it's fun. the last time uh I guess it was, no, it was for the first, the first solo show that I did with 
Cooper Cole, um, I was finishing the work during the uh, during the 2016 U.S. election, and I kind of knew what was going to happen, um, and I was really extremely upset about it. Uh, and I remember the day after the election, I went into my studio and looked at all the work that I was doing, and. Um, I, it's it's not it's not a healthy or good thing to constantly ask oneself but i always ask myself like is this is, why am i doing this like why you know, is considering everything that's going on why is this an important is this still an important thing to do and so as the work kind of changed and i arrived here at these new paintings uh you know, finishing them off during the global pandemic or finishing some of them off during the global pandemic, the same question kind of arose. Um, but I found that, you know, the, the process of making them kept me really grounded and, and uh, maintained my, my fascination with the things that I think are, are, helpful in these moments like maintain my 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 belief that there are certain underpinning elements of of aesthetics and and human behavior that are are redeeming and salvageable so i'm not i'm not suggesting that these are like some kind of like grand grand gestures extolling human virtue but i it if i can continue to to be fascinated with the work that I'm making in light of everything that's happening, then usually, you know, if it helps me go further into it, even go further into like the trauma of being in this moment, yeah. then I usually feel like intuitively I'm on the right track. Yeah. That's I definitely, yeah. I definitely abandon a lot of work because it just doesn't hold up to the, the, you know, terrors of the, the, the age that we're in. So. But it is fascinating that you were both kind of, thought of your practice as something meditative in the face of, um, you know, like a total like reorientation and in some ways chaos. Um, I was just gonna say one thing that I thought was really interesting and like the, uh, again, the experience of like walking into the show and being like, oh, how I love that we were, Rachel and I are like cosmically connected <laughs> through like certain <laughs> things that we're like doing in our work. So, um the the writer um david uh bachelor is it bachelor 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 i guess i think it's bachelor bachelor who mentioned who, uh you quote from uh, his book chromophobia um about sort of like um i guess like western anxiety around color the othering of color uh i found really fascinating in like in terms of like perception and the ways that like you know cultures particularly like um conservative cultures try to manage their perception of the world and manage other people's perceptions of the world i thought was really interesting and so while i was researching david bachelor and i really really want to read that book um i found out that an author that i frequently turn to when i'm trying to find language to describe what it is that i'm doing is this author named stephen bachelor who is uh one of the foremost scholars on on secular buddhism and uh, and so the, the study of, of Buddhism in general, uh, I didn't know this, but it turns out those two writers are brothers. And it was just kind of interesting to me that they're both kind of dealing with perception in in different different but very similar kind of ways, depending on on what you think perception encompasses. But that for me was like one of those little like thunderbolt moments where I was like, oh. Of course, so cool. of course. Like I love, I love those kind of coincidences. So that's awesome. That's amazing. Amazing. What are the chances? <laughs> yeah, kind of funny. Um. Okay, so there's a question. Um, you, I mean, you guys can see it. As a, do you want to? I mean, you can ask it. You can unmute yourself if you want to ask them. Yeah. Um. Hi, Rachel and Scott. Thank you so much Hi. for sharing. <laughs> yeah, it's been a really great conversation. I was just wondering, I felt like Scott, um, you talked about this a little bit about like ideas of abstraction and perception and how 
your mind kind of starts to generate these like images and structures. Um, but I was also wondering about hearing um, if you had more thoughts on that, Scott, and also Rachel, your relationship to abstraction as well. Do you want to go? I can start off. Um, yeah, I'm so, I'm so curious because like... Uh, I think that for me, like, uh, I have a kind of a representational st start to work. So I had a long kind of art uh, education, I guess. So I started educating or learning about art in high school. And so in that time, I think I did a lot of kind of like just regular representational type of drawing and things were just really different. And I think in that time, um, I thought of abstraction as something freeing and I did it for my own time and I didn't um, really so much, uh, I guess, have like this idea of it as, um, I didn't think so much of it as I did when I thought of something representational and I enjoyed that. And so um, I think that was a transition moment for me where, uh, finishing high school, I didn't necessarily expect to have um, abstraction be part of my life, but it's what got me uh, into following it for college and for like my actual art education. So it's been for me like home um, the whole time that I've kind of grown and learned about my work. It's so, fu it's so funny that you said that because like I, I mean, starting off by like making films and doing zines and stuff like that. Like I always painted for myself, like abstract paintings, just in a really like quiet way. Cause I thought it was kind of sort of uncool in a way. Like I was really suspicious about museums. Like I wasn't raised going to museums. I like was very suspicious about the art world in general uh, cause of the people that, that, that I liked were usually the people that were like never allowed into museological spaces or into like art galleries. So um, it felt almost like I was like in doing abstraction, I was like, oh, this is like a weird tradition that I'm like kind of ambivalent about. Uh, but I did it more and more. And as I got more comfortable and learned that there was this whole alternate history of abstraction, which I, I remember you saying you really liked the Hilma Af Klint show uh, that was at the Guggenheim. Um, she's a really good example of this whole other motivation behind pursuing abstraction you know it's not that's not um not that abstraction means nothing but that it actually like has an intimate like sort of celebratory um and insightful kind of component to it so i i got more comfortable with it and eventually like i got comfortable with showing abstraction and realizing that this was actually as as valuable or maybe even more valuable than, than the films and, and collages I was making at that time uh, and then I just realized like the more I looked at at at, uh, at the types of abstraction and types of artists that weren't traditionally canonized that there's this whole undercurrent of abstraction that that connected with the, connected with the things that I thought were only available through other forms of artwork um, you know, it's, yeah, it's, I think with times we can like think that uh, abstraction has no meaning, but I think that there's you know meaning in everything, and so I think that's what you're kind of it's touching on with the Hilma uh, show is that like there's a a lot of um, symbolism in the work, and I think that we can forget that every single shape and everything has its actual symbol and connection to real life, and you are, we're always going to be seeing that even if it's um, very subtle. Uh, I think we, we get an energy from everything just because of the way that the world is already um, painted to look. Um, For sure, absolutely. It's, fu it's funny even thinking about like, certain artists, like I always refer to Agnes Martin as the mm -hmm. schizophrenic lesbian Zen master, because these are all the phrases that never get associated with her, even though this is exactly what she was and that she was very open about personally, but that like neither the academics nor like the marketplace could stomach, like they couldn't deal with the fact that she was these things. And so we just focus on like the calm quietness of the work, not the incredible kind of torrent of sensation and, and experience that went into producing them. 
you know, the idea that these were somehow like created in a void and like talk about a void rather than a really lush bed of individuated, very peculiar kind of grasp of the world. There's, um... Yeah, and then I see that Chris Sand wrote a comment or like question. Yeah, Hi. Two, <laughs> it's nice to meet you. Two super um, good questions from Chris Sand and... Yeah, um, that's like definitely a very like good example of exactly and like something that's happened and I think it's a really great book to read uh, the chromophobia book it's like really easy to read too it's kind of like one of those student books that you would read in school but um it kind of speaks on how the Wizard of Oz was um this really radical movie when it came out and it's hard for us to even put our brains there but um the idea of that much color was like jolting and like revolting at that time and the movie was like completely a flop and so we're looking at this movie now and thinking that it's so great because of the color but that was completely uh part of why it was so hated when it came out and wasn't a, a, a hit movie at all and so I think that's just part of how much um power that color can have there's stories of like little kids being like walked through like post-war London with like everything like bombed to smithereens and like sort of, you know, smoke still hanging in the air to go see screenings of like The Wizard of Oz and being traumatized by seeing that much color all at once where they're just like, yeah. it's like nothing that they have around them right now. Like, and to go, I mean, and Chris Ann's question about the, um, Greek marbles being bleached, um, in Western Europe is really interesting um, because, I mean, some scholars have written about how that and our perception of Greek art being white has affected and fed into white supremacy too. And the way we're used to looking at neutral colors and looking at white skin um, in this like really polished way. Um, so it is, yeah, I mean, to Chris Ann's point, I'm sure you all can see the question, but it is very, radical yeah i think that art history is definitely a huge part of white supremacy and yeah exactly it's the way that it's it's what it's probably was really created for but now we <laughs> see it in a very different way yeah um jack deep has a question too i don't know if you want to ask it or you can just read it it's just before chris Ann's question um but jack deep you can ask it if you want it <laughs> if you want to if not it's okay no pressure um yeah, no, that was such a really inspiring conversation, and I really liked what um, both of you guys kind of like touched on this, this idea of like narrowing, your, like narrowing the scope of revision. And I guess, how do you guys like what kind of freedoms um, do you guys like find when you do that? And like, how I guess also how does that then relate to staying committed to the process and like trying not to dwell, dwell too much on like the finished product of a piece? But I guess like thinking about the process and also thinking about like how sometimes when we do put like constraints around ourselves, um, can that be a good thing? What, what are some positive things that kind of come out of that for the both of you guys? Uh, I think I understand like your question is kind of like, uh, kind of talking about the process, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's important to make uh, kind of rules for yourself like when you're creating the work, but I think it's also, um, it's important to know that like the rule, I, I guess it's like you're making the rule, but how many rules are you making? And I think when you're aware of it, it makes it much easier to create than to not be aware and like to subconsciously have these rules. And I think when we are expecting the work to look a certain way, that is creating a rule. And so I think that completely letting go of those you do create rules, but it's in, in a way that um, it's going to make it uh, the work very concise. And so I think that it's very, uh, it's limiting, but in a way that's freeing. And so you're being more intentional uh, instead of uh, being so uh, expecting, I guess. I like, what, I like what Rachel said. It's like, like, it's almost like the act of respiration. Like you kind, of, you, you kind of let things go and then you rein it in. And it's like, it's like you kind of know what the parameters are before things get out of control, especially I guess when you're feeling out a new aspect of your practice, you kind of like 
try to take the the rails off of it for a second and then you kind of know sort of bring it back within so, like a certain um set of elements that make it coherent to you still or keep it coherent to you it's almost yeah, like think, a, more like music yeah. in a way then i guess it's like that's the best way to you know there's improvisation and then there's noise and there's like a fine line hmm. yeah i think in my work that's like uh I'm usually like now I'm starting to work um, on more paneled surfaces and I'm using a lot of white to be like a rule that I have of kind of like interacting with the white of the white space. And so that's like an example of like uh, a way that I've created like something that allows me to know the work is finished. Um, and that's usually I like I'm going, I'm breathing out and like, putting as much energy and like kind of like unconscious thought into the work and then I'm breathing it back in by like connecting it to the space of the, the outside of the frame and then also the white of the wall and um, kind of imagining that this work is not just uh, on its the dimension of the wood panel but also in space of the wall or being emulated to look like it is. Add one more thing to what Jagdeep was uh, talking about, like in terms of like the 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 I guess the um, the seemingly contradictory idea of like rules but freedom at the same time. Is that sort of what you were kind of getting at, Jagdeep? Like this idea that you have to ex inhabit this contradictory space where you're like allowing your like a flow to happen, but within a boundary. Is that sort of where you were? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. It's, it's, um, to me, for me in particular, um, I, the, the process of, of, again, because I'm interested in the, the way the mind works uh, under a variety of circumstances. Um, I'm also interested in like sort of non-normative states of mind. Like there's a huge um, history of schizophrenia in my family matrilineally, which I should have inherited, but narrowly dodged. And by narrowly, I actually mean very narrowly, like I do have some aspects of it, is I'm aware that without certain understandings of constraint, that left to one's own, one's own devices, as we see with, you know, sort of the situation in the US right now, complete freedom as interpreted by certain people is actually quite deleterious to everything around it if that makes sense mm -hmm. like yeah, the notion of freedom is so multivalent and so complex and so difficult that i find it's interesting like the artist is in this unique position to sort of say that like within you know the whirling kind of creative chaos that artists supposedly inhabit uh it's actually the rules that make the artwork. And it's actually the rules, the arbitrary rules that make culture, actually. You know, I mean, across the board, all culture. It's like, it's, uh, uh, you know, we're given, we're thrown a set of information that comes in through our senses. And it's only the rules that we've inherited or been trapped or trained in or that we train or liberate ourselves from that actually make a particular singular type of sense out of it all right yeah definitely well thank you everyone i think we can conclude food um thank you everyone for joining us and thank you so much rachel thank you so much for an amazing <laughs> conversation um, thank you guys yeah it was such a pleasure to do this um and i hope everyone has a good day